Our scripture reading for today is from Acts 2, 37 to 42. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. In that day, about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, I want to thank all of our musicians, our adult and children's choirs. It's wonderful to have such beautiful worship together. How many of you remember at the beginning of the summer, uh, we made a goal of putting together a thousand health kits? Anybody remember that? Anybody remember how many health, health kits we actually put together? Put 706 health kits together which isn't a thousand, but First UMC put a total of 1,112 kits. That includes the school kits, the school bags that we've had had for the past month or so, the uh, sewing kits, layout kits, uh, all of these different kits. So we put 1,112 total kits together throughout since last September. So I want to congratulate you all on that wonderful Wonderful feat. That's, um, you all are amazing givers here in the church. Yesterday we had our Dakota Marketplace, uh, which was in our gym. It's a conference-wide event that happens uh, once a year. And this, all of the, around the conference people, especially in our area of the state, people were bringing their kits. You can still see the uh, truck in the parking lot at back. They were bringing their kits, and they were bringing other supplies to be auctioned off, to crafts, to be sold. In total, including the uh, monetary value of the kits that came in yesterday and the money that was raised, it is estimated that $121,000 was raised yesterday for hunger here, hunger and missions here in the Dakotas and around the world. So that, yes. It's amazing that we can do this together. So in our scripture today, we check in in the kind of the middle of the story. If you're paying attention to that first line, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? When we were talking about what this is, that they're saying it's a sermon, That's the chapter before in Acts. I didn't want to read to you the whole sermon from Peter, but it is Peter talking to the crowd. And our story today is the crowd's reaction to Peter talking about Christ. The crowd was so affected that they wanted to know what to do next, how to respond. They were cut to the heart. They were deeply affected by the words of Peter and wanted to to change their lives. So Peter lays out what they should do. They should repent and be baptized. They should study the scriptures. They should have fun together, fellowship together, break bread together, and stay in prayer. This is one full schedule if I've ever seen one. Basically, Peter was telling them to turn around and refocus their lives. Now, for those of you who are like me, we think sometimes that we know where we're going. But I want you to watch this clip. And actually, if someone standing next to the lights could dim the lights in the dome before we start. Somebody did that in the last service, and that helped. Pay attention. 
face that's ridiculous. All right, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Put your window down! You want something? Uh, he's probably drunk. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank Terrific. you. You're going the wrong way. What? Okay, so this isn't a very important clip, but it's pretty funny. Uh, if this movie is called Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. You can turn the lights back on. Thank you. Uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, it's the story of these two guys, and they're trying to get home for what I think is Thanksgiving. I might have that wrong. Um, and they have many travel mishaps. Their planes don't function right. Their trains uh, aren't perfect. And after this scene, the car, I believe, loses its doors and becomes kind of a burnt out shell, but they do made it, make it home in the car all the way uh, home. But this is, this is how we work sometimes. We get pretty focused on the end result and we forget about the journey in between. We go the wrong direction, even when we know what our destination might be. How many of you have been hiking before? Hiking? Quite a few of you. Uh, I've ever get lost. Anybody ever get lost while hiking? Yeah. <laughs> I've always loved to hike, and I learned from an early age, from uh, mainly from my father, that it can be much more fun and more grueling to not follow a path. So one time I was in college, I went hiking with a friend of mine in Estes Park, Colorado. We followed the path up to the top of the mountain. Got a little lost at the top of the mountain. We didn't know where the path was, but at the top we could see the camp that we were staying at. We could visibly see it because we were so high up. So we decided, well, camp is that way. We'll go in that direction. So we started down the mountain. About 20 minutes later, uh, we passed the path. And the path was going in the, a different direction, off to the side, and we knew that camp was going forward, so we decided that we knew what we were doing more than the path, and uh, we just kept going. Bet you can guess what happened. We, uh, the path veered off because pretty soon there was about a 15-foot rock face that we ended up needing to climb down. We eventually made it down with a few spills and a few, uh, few mishaps, but uh, not too many injuries. But we made it down, uh, luckily. Luckily, it was only about 15 feet. This is our life often in Christ. We think because we know what the ultimate plan is, because we've chosen Christ, that we can't really get lost. But the truth is that we get really distracted. We really need to pay attention to that other couple in the car yelling at us that we're going the wrong direction. This past few weeks, we've been talking about practices in the church and as a community of faith that help us to grow individually and as a congregation. We talked about radical hospitality and what that means. We talked about passionate worship. Today we're talking about intentional faith development, about the systems in our own lives, in our own life together as a church that fosters our journeys in Christ, giving these Bibles to third graders. We give them this year, our Sunday school, our third grade Sunday school focuses on how to read the Bible so that when our uh, kids get to fourth grade, when they get to middle school, high school, and become adults, they know how to use their Bibles. They know how to read it and to look into it. Each class we have as children and as adults, they teach us different parts of scripture, different parts of our faith. Now the early church they really led the way with a community much like Peter was talking about to this crowd. You start with repentance. You reorient your life. Repentance really does mean to, to change your focus, to change your mind. You find the right direction. 
You profess your faith. In the early church, this meant baptism into the community. We do baptism as children, and so our professions of faith come at the time of confirmation or come at the time of professing your faith as an adult when you're joining the church. We study the scriptures together. We join together in fun. We eat meals together, especially we eat the Lord's Supper together. And we join in prayer and in worship. The early church was especially good at bringing people together in family. They called each other brothers and sisters. In the book in which we're basing our series, Bishop Snazy tells the story of a young mother, a widow, an outcast. She would go about the business of her day, baking bread, filling her jar with water from the well. She struggled as she thought about feeding her children and herself after her husband had died and she no longer had any means of making money. They barely survived the loneliness that she had never imagined met her when she became an outcast. As she did her work each day, something started to change. She started to think about these stories. The story she had heard the night before when she gathered with her neighbors for prayer and supper. It was the story of a woman who met Jesus at a well and how Jesus talked to her about living water. Hearing this story taught her to think of another, of Jesus touching the man who had been paralyzed for so long, telling him to walk. Then story after story cascaded into her mind. She thought about shepherd and the sheep, the woman and her coin, the the two women crying deeply for their friend, and the joy of an empty tomb. The poor widow giving more at the temple than all the rich people. She smiled to herself as she thinks about that one. She heard about Jesus for the first time only a few months earlier, and now his stories, they had become her stories. Word had spread early about his horrible death and then amazingly about his being alive. And his followers were gathering, they were gathering first in Jerusalem and then across the countryside, and and she was a part of this movement. She began to listen, and she began to make it her own. And the people who told her these stories, they invited her into their homes, her an outcast. Everyone knew that she she was destitute without a husband, but they treated her differently. She and her daughters, they ate with them. They received more than they could ever repay, and they prayed for her and with her and her daughters, and she prayed with them. This unexpected kindness and love changed her life. Suddenly, she didn't feel alone and abandoned. She was a part of a family, a part of a community, and her life, her life counted for something. She couldn't get enough of these stories. She wanted to know more, and she wanted to tell people about them. They, these stories, they filled her life so that the burdens of her day no longer focused her day. Yes, she still had to go to the well and get water. Yes, she still had to find food for her family. But each day she had Christ and this other family in her life. And suddenly the burdens felt lighter and the days more full of life. You see, this woman, this story... These are, these are the stories of the early church, the stories of the thousands who began to make up that community, the thousands who began to follow the life of Christ. They, they took their lives and they put, came together. They came together to study, they came together to learn, and they came together to be a family. As the centuries continued, the story continued again, again and again, The community of faith made time for each other. In the 1700s, the story continued. John Wesley, the founder of our Methodist tradition, truly believed in intentional faith development. He believed in community and accountability. He believed and taught that Christians were to live their lives working towards perfection, living their lives better each and every day. 
a life of striving to be like Christ, a life of moving forward, of backsliding, of starting over, but all with Christ as the goal. This woman's story continues in the lives of others. There was a man who had been working all day in the fields outside of London. He had been working from sunup to sundown, and when he got home, instead of following the example of his fellow workers, he, he cleaned himself up, he ate a small meal, and he began to clean his home. And he began to pray for those who would be coming as a, as a Methodist class leader. He prayed for each person who would come. One by one, they began to show up. They filled his room with a laughter and a warmth that his stove could never have filled it with. These men and these women, they also spent their days working hard, some in, in stables and fields, others in shops or kitchens. When everyone had arrived, he reminded them of the promise they had made to each other to attend upon public worship of God, include the reading and and study of scripture, receive communion, and commit to praying for each other every day. He read them about their promise to watch over each other's souls, not just watch over each other's bodies, making sure they're fed and cared for, but their souls, making sure their spirits are focused on God. He led them in their singing and their prayer, and they all shared their week they shared their joys, their sorrows, their triumphs, their tribulations, they, they, their times when they felt that God's grace couldn't be more apparent. They prayed together, they gave an offering, and they parted from one another saying that grace be with them. And this man, this class leader, he, he cleans his house, he goes to bed thinking, that his life is no longer about making a living. The hard work he does in the field is not what his life is for. His life is for the care of souls around him, for the care of his brothers and sisters in Christ. As Methodists today, we continue this legacy. We pull together groups of unlikely people. We gather as a community and we gather to live our lives according to the standard of Christ. We live our lives as those changed by Christ and we must reorient ourselves each and every day. At our Wednesday service this week, we talked about how we become distracted, how we chase the little rabbit trails of our lives. We go the wrong way, we need to turn around. How each week, or each day we come back to our faith. Whether through Bible study or corporate worship, we come together as a community to get on the right path. And this is not a path that we can take alone. As the scripture showed us, the studying of scripture and the devotion to fellowship, they were right beside each other. They were just as important to the community. Breaking bread together is an act of the community, not the individual. And yes, that in community might be two or three people gathered in a home, or it might be 200 people coming together at worship at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. Over the last year and a half or so, I've been getting to know you all, been watching. I know those of you who t come into this building and, and turn your life around just a little bit more. You refocus your week or your day. This becomes a place of comfort, of, of fellowship, of family. A place where Christ turns us back in the right direction and helps us off our rabbit trails and onto the correct path. There are those who come once a month, those who come once a week, those who are here every single day or maybe just when there's activities. This church is a place of refocusing our lives on our journey in Christ. Some of you have been in small groups for decades. Others haven't ever stepped in a church before or haven't stepped inside for a very long time. This is a moment of reorienting your lives, focusing 
on Christ. Intentional faith development is not about finding that one class that tells us what we need to know or that one verse that fixes everything. Intentional faith development is finding those, those places and those people that honk at us and yell at us when we need to turn around. Intentional faith development is joining together as a community of worshipers, of people coming and changing and turning around for God. Let us pray. Heavenly God, you are our right path. Our journey through life is a journey meant to be with you and with those around us. Help us to stay on this path to go the correct way and to listen to those who are screaming our name when we go the wrong direction. Help us to reorient our lives to your name. And in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.